And the title of the message for today is Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one. And this is a quote from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, where we are going today. So I'm reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, this is clearly a future promise, a prophecy, that he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This was certainly not fulfilled in Isaiah's time. And here in this text, we have the word my, repeated four times in, in one verse. My servant, my chosen one, my spirit is upon him. My soul delights in him. Clearly, this servant has a very special relationship with God that goes beyond being just the usual prophet or a messenger of God. And his mission goes beyond the established order of the day of Isaiah, of Israel being God's nation. It says he will bring justice to the Gentiles, to all nations. And throughout the book of Isaiah, we have these images of other nations being called God's people. Egyptians, Ethiopians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Edomites, Moabites, the ones that are considered by default to be the enemies of God's people. Throughout the book of Isaiah, God says, I will call them all my people. I'll read the next two verses, chapter 42, verses 2 and 3. It's about this servant. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flux he will not quench. He will bring forth justice or truth. Now, this servant of God sounds very unique. This servant of the Lord is not like Prophet Samuel, for instance, who cut off the head of the Malachite king. No, this servant would not do such things. In fact, he would call Gentiles his people. And through all the roughness and harshness and cruelness of the Old Testament that some cannot understand, while others cannot accept it, and they reject God because of it. Here we have a strange, unusual, new image of a servant who is immensely, incredibly, unbelievably gentle. This is not your usual Old Testament stuff. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Now, this is not to be taken literally, as if he has a reduced lung capacity or is unable to communicate clearly. It's about his characteristics. He will not be making noise, blowing his own trumpet. He will be incredibly humble and modest. A bruised reed he will not break. Again, the image of someone who is incredibly and exceptionally gentle. Someone who will not use the physical force the way it is used in this world. There is no trace of force, of coercion or violence in him. Just because he is so gentle and modest and unobtrusive, it does not mean that he does not speak the truth and stands up for justice, for what is right. As it says, a bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench, but he will bring forth justice or truth. So he stands up for justice and speaks the truth, but he does it in such 
disarming, non-threatening way. If you think about how Jesus addressed those who opposed him in his day, the religious rulers of his day, he spoke some very piercing, straight, very direct, very tough words to them. But as some people point out, they said he did it with tears in his eyes. And we read Christ's words as emails. You know how easy it is to misinterpret the emails. That there is no body language, there is no face expression, there is no tone of, tone of voice. We often assume that the message is hostile and we take offense. Whereas if you spoke to people face to face, the same words, the same message would have been received without any problem. So if we only have Christ's words as email, so to say, how do you know how do we know what his tone of voice was when he spoke these words? Heavy, tough words. How do we know what his face expression was? How do you know what the look in his eye was like? And most films about Jesus, they struggle to properly represent him. Apart from just, just a few, like Ben-Hur, for instance. It never shows Christ's face, so it doesn't fall into this trap. And the miracle maker, is the best ever face and character representation of Jesus I've seen, probably because it doesn't use real people, but clay animation. After Judas betrayed Jesus and met him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus called him friend. Friend, why did you come? And this is certainly unusual. If somebody stabs us in the back, we could probably think of a very different repertoire of words to describe that person. I'll read the next verse, verse 4. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. He will not be failed nor discouraged. Now he will not, he will not fail the Hebrew word that was translated as fail is actually bruised or crushed. Why do I say that? Because in the previous verse, we have the same identical word used to describe the reed. It says we have the bruised reed he will not break. So he will not be discouraged nor bruised or crushed until he has completed his mission. And then the faraway lands will await his law his instruction and his teaching. So here we have the image of a bruised reed or crushed reed. And then the image of the servant, when he accomplishes his mission, he will look exactly like that reed, bruised or broken. And this act of being bruised or crushed is directly linked with him establishing justice and judgment on earth. And this image seems to point to the cross. And as we continue to read, this grows more obvious. So I'll read the next verse, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. The servant of the Lord is righteous. And because of this, God gives him to be a covenant to people, including the Gentiles, to all nations. This is a different covenant to the one given through Moses. It was given specifically and only to the nation of Israel. This is the new covenant that Christ spoke about during the Last Supper. This servant becomes the luminary to the Gentiles. He becomes the light of the world. Next verse, verse 7. Well, I'll read verse 6 again just because it continues into verse seven, 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Verse 7. To open blind eyes, to open blind eyes, 
to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in the darkness from the prison house. Now, John the Baptist knew that he himself was the fulfillment of the prophecy of the one crying in the desert in Isaiah chapter 40. How did he know that? God told him directly, you are the one crying in the desert. So I'm pretty sure he took great interest in this chapter 40 and a few chapters around it, like chapter 42, because it's a part of a unit. And as originally, of course, the, the Bible was not divided into chapters. So John was looking at this story unit that describes the coming Messiah. And the mission of the Messiah was, as it reads in verse 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And while John the Baptist was sitting in the darkness of the prison, these words that he most likely memorized were on his mind. And I suspect he understood and interpreted these words in such a way that he was expecting to be released from the prison by the Messiah. And when this did not happen, John the Baptist questioned whether Jesus was the Messiah or Christ from Isaiah 42, who was supposed to release the prisoners and set them free. And then as we read it in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 to 5. And when John had heard in prison about the work of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see. That's how Christ begins. The blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now Jesus knew exactly what John was thinking. So he responded by referring to the, to the text, the passage John had on his mind. To open blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. So this text begins with the words, to open blind eyes. That is the mission of the Messiah. And Christ responds by saying, tell John, the blind see. Tell John the blind say, yes, I am fulfilling this prophecy that you are doubting right now. And moving now further in the chapter to verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 42, 19 and 20. <clears throat> Isaiah 42, 19 and 20. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. Why is this Lord servant, the chosen one, the Messiah described as being blind and deaf? Let's read the next verse, the final verse for today. Verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. Now this chapter began with, the, with the, the words of the Lord saying, Behold my servant in whom, I'm, in whom I delight. And this chapter ends by saying about the same servant, I am pleased with his righteousness. He has magnified and exalted my law and made it glorious. Again, John the Baptist probably memorized this part of the book of Isaiah. And when he heard the words, God spoke while Jesus was baptized. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God confirmed to him that this was the Messiah from Isaiah chapter 42. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. 
this chosen one is the only servant of God that has kept the law and that was righteous. The only one without sin. There is no one else. So why is this servant then called blind and deaf? Those religious leaders around Jesus say that he was breaking the law. You know, he was doing unrighteous thing. He was breaking the Sabbath. All the while, he could pierce their souls, x-ray their hearts, read their minds, and see that while they're saying this, they're plotting to kill him. Everywhere he looked, Jesus, the servant of the Lord, with his x-ray vision, he could see people's heart as they truly are, unrighteous, unlawful, sinful, and broken. He, the Messiah, he should have been the one to tell everyone, you are all sinners. I am the only one keeping the law. You should all be condemned. None of you is the way God wants you to be. He could have said that, but this was not his purpose nor his mission. He was not to break the already bruised reed. So he turned the blind eye, so to say, to all these things he saw. He made himself deaf, closed his ears not to hear. He was continually, unceasingly surrounded by sin and had to live in its filth as the sinless one. And he patiently, gently bore with us. He bore with all of us. This is the Messiah. The servant of the Lord from Isaiah 42. He is the light to the Gentiles, the light of the world, the one we are waiting for, the desire of all nations. He is the one who will change everything. He was the only righteous one, the only one who kept the law, the only sinless one, the only one in whom God delights, with whom God is pleased. This was confirmed directly by God from heaven when John the Baptist heard the words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased.